Here on The Vinyl Guide, we've had many famous names, but this week we have an absolute legendary one. Only seven people in history have had the name Ramon, and four of them are no longer with us. And today we have the youngest and perhaps the most handsome one, CJ Ramon. How are you doing today, CJ? Um, good. I'm doing good. That, that was a very... Uh... Very um, generous introduction. I appreciate that. <laughs> no worries. Let me ask you, is it, first off, did you legally change your name to Ramon? I mean, if you were buying a house, would you sign your name Ramon? Absolutely not. My father would disown me if I ever did that. But it is something that you were required to take on when you became a member of the band. Everyone that ever played with the Ramones had to take it on. And of course, I was more than proud to take it on, and, and still I'm proud to use it. Okay. And uh, so before we get into the kind of the, 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 the history of the Ramones and your time with them, where, where did you grow up? Where did, uh, where did young CJ call home? I was actually born in Queens, New York. Um, lived in Hollis for a while. We relocated up to Boston for a, a period of time where my mom was from, and then uh, moved back to Queens, and then eventually moved to Long Island. So pretty much Long Island is my has been. Uh, I, if, when I'm asked where I grew up, I tell everyone Long Island. Interestingly, Queens though as well. I mean, the Ramones were from Queens, so they uh, they were local heroes when you were when you were there. Absolutely, absolutely. That uh, in fact, the reason why I uh, I really. Well, the first time I ever heard of them was my, my older cousins were fans. They were, uh, and that's how I how I first heard them. Although I didn't really become a Ramones fan until I met a really pretty blonde girl who took me to her bedroom and seduced me to the uh, the sounds of the first Ramones record. So <laughs> that sounds like it might have been a challenge to keep up with the tempo there. Um, <laughs> which. Uh... <laughs> So that was your introduction to the Ramones is uh, is some uh, some 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 girl you met. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's um it's the the it's funny. You know, the Ramones even though they were a local band and and whatnot, they they never really felt like a local band. They always felt like the Ramones, you know, they were much bigger than being a local band. Um and it's a, it's one of the odd things about uh, about who they actually were. Well, I guess it's kind of weird because it, being from New York, you just immediately identified with the Ramones, but they still maintain that aura that all the big, you know, big bands did from, you know, from going way back. You know, there was always kind of this big mystery around um, around the, the, the bigger bands and the Ramones always maintain that even though they had their local band status. They really it's a really strange uh, thing about them, I guess. I, I know there's a bit of a phenomenon whenever a local band becomes a national band, a very popular band. A lot of times they they, they get disowned a bit by their their core following. Right. That, that doesn't seem to be the case with the Ramones. I think they they were loved by New Yorkers all the way up to current day. No problems. Absolutely, but you know the the one interesting side note I I put to that is is there was a lot of kind of disappointment that the Ramones did not do their final show in New York. And while we did have plans to finish out uh, in New York, originally it was supposed to be seven nights at CBGB's. But when the deal couldn't get hammered out, there was a conscious effort to do the final show in California because we just always did better in California than we did in New York. We just had more fans in California on the West Coast. And I always kind of attributed that, that to the fact that California to this day is still, you know, punk rock and rock and roll still are the major draw on the, you know, for, for California. It still is. Rock and roll and punk rock are still king and queen in uh in California, whereas in New York, New York is really a lot more trendy than than uh, California is, believe it or not, when it comes to music. You know, California is definitely the more um, liberal, progressive state, but in some ways it's so conservative. They won't let go of their punk rock and rock and roll <laughs> over there. So that's how we ended up doing our final show there. So you were into punk rock at a, at a young age, I imagine. What What kind of records did you grow up on? Um, believe it or not, I was, I was, I'm, I'm lucky. My, my mom and dad listened to just about everything. And that was my major source of, of, uh, of music when I was a kid and, uh, 
even up to my teens. So I grew up on everything from uh, country and, uh, you know, like real old school country and um, a lot of the early 70s country to um, all the 50s and doo-wop stuff. And, and my mom liked some of the big band era stuff as well as classical. Plus, you know, of course, they listen to everything from the 60s and the early 70s. So my exposure to music was pretty pretty uh diverse it sounds like yeah, yeah diverse yeah and and i always considered myself to be a music fan not a genre fan so much but a music fan but realistically the the music the first thing i ever heard that really made me kind of break out and start my own musical identity was black sabbath that was the band i was into horror movies when i was a kid and 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 thanks to those unbelievably gorgeous vampire women from the hammer films um <laughs> responsible for my sexual awakening black sabbath really tied a lot of my my favorite cultural things is you know movies and music and comic books it all kind of got tied together in black sabbath and i think that's probably why i just it's the first band i he ever heard that i was like i ran out and bought everything i could from which of course started me down the, the, the path of, of becoming a, a huge metal fan. But the Ramones absolutely were the band that made me start listening to punk. You know, if you would have looked at my record collection at 16, you would have found everything from um, the soundtrack to Happy Days straight through till, uh, you know, um, the Sex Pistols, never mind the Bollocks and, and any of the Clash records at all. Um, the Ramones, The Damned, from the metal genre, Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, The Scorpions. That was one thing cool about that heavy metal did for me. It actually made me look at uh, bands from other countries besides just Europe. I mean, just uh, the UK. You know, you find all kinds of other bands from France and, and Germany and, and uh, uh, some of the bands from Scandinavia, some of the black metal stuff and whatnot. So I, I really have listened to in my lifetime, but um, even in my teenage years, a pretty wide range of music. Sounds like it, and and you could hear that sort of uh, influence on your uh, on, on your new album, American Beauty, which it really uh, once you started talking about country and some of the influence around there, that's that started clicking in because there absolutely is that appreciation for a tune, but of course with the punk up tempo beat. Yeah, um, absolutely. So before we get into American uh, Beauty here, so Black Sabbath is the band that inspired you to pick up an instrument and try to do it yourself, yeah? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Did, did you start with bass? I did. What? Well, it's really funny how I came to came to the bass too. When I was younger, I had tried. Well, I was. Uh, I actually went, um, sang in the choir when I was younger. I had a really high voice, uh, so I, I sang in the choir. I got into sports later on. I started playing soccer. That was uh, my main sport. I played uh, baseball a bit when I was a kid and ice hockey. But soccer was one that stuck. But what happened was I, um, when I graduated from eighth grade, going into ninth, which was going into high school, I went to Catholic school. Um, and I picked the Catholic school on Long Island with the best soccer team. And that's where I wanted to go. And that's where I was going. But in that summer between eighth and ninth grade, I had a an intense growth spurt, which uh, just destroyed all the connective tissue in my knees, and I had to wear knee braces for two years. So when that next year came around and and uh, school started, and I had to leave my classes early and take the elevator and all the stuff, and it was pretty depressing. It was it was uh, I was really really down, and and my dad recognized it and he said to me, "Listen, you can't sit around and do nothing. You got to find something else to do." I had some friends who had a band. Um, they didn't have a bass player. They played everything from the Beatles to Neil Young to The Who to uh, Black Sabbath, like anything they were technically capable of, the cars and like, anything they could technically handle, uh, they did. So I said to my dad, I said, all right, well, get me a bass and uh, I'll see, you know, I figured I could, that's what, that would be my new hobby. So I got a bass. I never took a lesson. I just sat in my room and sounded things out for a, a good long while went down to uh my buddy's rehearsal one day and carried in my bass and, and they're like oh you got a, a bass great sit down we'll teach you a few things and i was like well i was i already kind of know a few things and uh 
and uh, we started playing, and that was it. I never took a lesson, and those guys were cool enough to show me how to play songs and whatnot, but um, I was pretty much self-taught, and um, to this day, I play by ear. I still don't know all the notes on the neck, which is just out of sheer laziness, but it's, uh, it, it's, I think my, my whole approach to playing was a, was a bit different, but that's how I, uh, that's how I ended up on bass. Hey, it's worked for you, so you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If I had had my choice, I probably would have chosen drums. But I'm terrible at math, and probably bass is the better way for me to have gone because drums is all math. <laughs> are are you a secret drummer? Like every time, like during rehearsal, once the drummer goes to have a break, are you on the kit? Of course, I have a drum kit in my basement. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm secretly a wannabe drummer. Yeah, aren't we all? Um, so uh, so you start playing in bands. Did you start to do clubs from that point? Like how did you how did you you go from someone's garage to starting to to, to play around the neighborhood and maybe in some clubs in New York? Well, the first thing I the first thing you know besides the parties, my first gig in front of people was um i i belonged to the uh um the church youth group and we had a um talent show of sorts and uh me and the guys got up and did um shook me all night long by acdc mm -hmm. and the leader of our little youth group after the show we, we had a great time we played it was and it really got me hooked because that show in particular got me hooked because the girls were just screaming uncontrollably while we were playing which was of course whatever <laughs> young man wants to hear anyway so uh i uh so afterwards the uh, we sat down with our group leader and he was telling everybody how they did and he looked at me and he said you know you played really well but you look like you're having convulsions on stage and I, I thought to myself, that's perfect. That is perfect. I love that idea. I love it. So uh, that kind of that kind of got me locked in. But from there, I um, uh, I played with those guys for a while. And that you know, being kids, we just kind of fell apart. I eventually got into a band um, in high school that we really got serious and started to play. Um, local um like the when the fair came to town we got on the bill there we did some stuff at, stuff at the high school and eventually after high school we start actually while we were still in high school before we were old enough we we started playing in clubs in the area um the area where i came from there was a thriving um rock and roll club scene we had like four or five really good clubs within a 10 mile radius and they were packed day and night you know five days a week um, so I started playing clubs pretty young. Um, and then one day, um, a, uh, a kind of a legendary guy from our area, his name, uh, was Pete Persino. He used to play under the name of Guitar Pete. He was actually a, um, a Nashville guy for a good long time from Long Island, moved out to Nashville, uh, did some great stuff there and then, uh, came back here, used to, uh, do a lot of blues and rockabilly. He was uh, known for getting up with Richie Blackmore and 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 uh, trading riffs uh, with each other. He had a group with a, a couple of local guys. They had seen me play and they approached me one night after a show and said, "Hey, you know, would you be interested in playing with us?" Um, the name of that band was Guitar Pete's Axe Attack. Of course, eventually it just became Axe Attack. I I recorded well. I recorded one record with them but joined after they released their first record that's the band where i really cut my teeth um in the clubs really learned how to handle myself on stage uh, and pete was really a uh he was a great teacher it's a bit of a mentor to you during yeah those formative absolutely years. yeah if i if i had to say like if i had to point the finger at one person who really kind of helped me get to where i got to it would be him he was really the guy that that taught me how to handle myself and whatnot and, and kind of what the business was all about. So um, that's pretty much how, I, that, how my, uh, my early days went. I played with that band up until um, uh, pretty much almost up until I left for the Marine Corps. And what made you up and sign for the Marine Corps when, when, when you, your music career was starting to take shape? Well, what happened was the band with Pete kind of started started going in a direction that I didn't I wasn't really interested in going in I was uh I was working in a um in an aircraft factory near my house right out of high school Republic Fairchild and uh 
so I was making good money there. I was making good money with the band on weekends. My life was pretty good. And then, you know, within a, a year or so, the factory closed down. I was one of the first guys in the layoff. Me and my dad both worked there, in fact. And then uh, I, I left the band with Pete. And I had always kind of had it in my head that if I was not doing something worthwhile by the time I was 21, I was going to leave my hometown because my goal always was to get out and see the world regardless of anything else. I didn't care how I did it or any, I just want, I knew that I wanted to travel. I knew that I wanted to see the world and, and, and just kind of cut the cord and get out there. And when things kind of went south, when I realized, you know, I was, I was partying too much. I was, you know, the factory closed down. I was working as a landscaper. I wasn't doing much as far as a band goes. And, and I just woke up one morning and I was disappointed with where I was and what I was doing. And my dad's family is, um, you know, a military family. All the men uh, served in the military. And it was a pretty simple choice for me, although the Marine Corps was not a popular one because my dad and his bro brother were both Navy and my other uncle was Army. Uh, so going to the Marine Corps wasn't real popular, but I just went down to the recruiter and I sat down and talked to the recruiter for a little bit. And he asked me why I was enlisting. And I told him the same story I told you. And he said, OK, he's like, you know, you know, as long as you have an idea of of uh, why you're doing it and, and what you you know, what you want to do. I mean, my plan was when I when I gave it some thought, I was like, well, you know, I can go into the Marine Corps, stay in for eight years or 12 years and travel the world, do some stuff and, and maybe come home and then join the police force or something like that. That's a very mature uh, approach for a young man to be able to make, to look at themselves and say, you know, where I'm at right now is not where I want to be, and uh, I'm going to make a drastic choice. Quite quite often, joining the military is uh, often seen as a, <laughs> wow, what a, a radical thing to do. Right. Uh, and a lot of people, why would you want to do that? But you knew yeah. that it was going to be good for you. There was going to be something yeah. on the other side. Yeah, I was... And, and to tell you the truth, um, I really was, by that point, I was really undisciplined. I was really kind of spoiled. I had been making plenty of money and, and, and uh, really partying how I wanted, you know, however much and how often as I wanted to. Um, I, just, I just felt like, you know, I was not w as mature as I should be for 21, I kind of felt like I was still living like a teenager, which is kind of funny because eventually I just didn't, I lived my entire life as a teenager. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, so let's get to that. Out of the Marine Corps, how did you learn about the opportunity with the Ramones? Well, funny you should ask that because I wasn't yet out of the Marine Corps when I learned about the opportunity with the Ramones. I happened to be home and hear about the audition for the um, uh, for the Ramones through a friend of mine who was in a band with Joey's brother, uh, Mickey. I got um, uh, a phone call from a friend, a high school friend, who said, hey, Mickey told me the Ramones are auditioning bass players tonight at SIR Studio in Manhattan, or it might have been a day or two before. And I said, yeah, I'm in the Marine Corps. What does that matter to me? And he was like, you should go down. Just go down. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go down and meet the band. What the hell? So that's what I did. I, I had never played with a pick before. I, I had dabbled. I shouldn't say never. I had dabbled messing around with a pick, but I had never played, actually taken on that style of playing. And uh, I knew no Ramon songs. I hadn't played any type of cover since I was probably 18 or 19 years old. And uh, I, I just went for, for the fun of it, just to meet the band. So... The, the good thing about that is I wasn't nervous when I went. I had no expectation for making it. So I went down. And, and like I said, I never played with a pick. Um, I went down and... and um, you didn't prepare anything. You didn't go through learning beat on the brat or anything. You just kind of I, wanted to show up to shake their hand. I learned I want to be sedated. I just I picked the easiest, simplest song I could possibly learn. Um, and I went in and played it and uh, went and figured it out. It took me all of five minutes to do it. Uh, I threw my bass on my pickup truck. I drove into Manhattan and um, I went in and was met by uh, the drum tech, uh, Mitch Keller, who then introduced me to Monty Melnick, who then brought me into uh, this is SIR Studios on 25th Street, Manhattan. Um, Monty brought me into the room and introduced me to 
to Johnny and Mark. Um, I went over to Johnny and I said, hey, Johnny, Chris Ward, honor to meet you. Huge fan. Um, and he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, get your stuff set up. And I set up my stuff and he said, well, what do you know? I said, I could play. I want to be sedated. He was like, okay, fine. Mark counted it off. We played through it. Johnny said to me afterwards, you know, so, uh, and this was Johnny's way of gauging whether or not you were a true fan. Um, so how many uh, shows have you seen? So I, I said, probably 15 shows I've probably seen. And he's like, where have you seen us? And I said, you know, I've seen you in Manhattan uh, um, uh, at the Ritz. I've seen you on Long Island at uh, Lemoore's Far East. I've seen you at Lemoore in Brooklyn. You know, I just gave him a quick rundown, a couple places I'd seen him. And, um, and he was like, okay, let's play it again. And we play, went into it again. And as we were playing, Joey came in the room. So as soon as uh, uh, we, we we ended the song. I put my bass down and walked over, introduced myself to Joey, told him, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, friends with um, with Frank Saida, who was my friend who played with uh, with Mickey. And he was like, oh, yeah, he told me you were coming and, you know, nice to meet you. Blah, blah. So Monty came over and said, OK, that's it. We'll give you a call. And I said, thanks. And I left and that was it. I went home and called everybody I knew. I just jammed with the Ramones, you know. <laughs> the same um, song twice, right? Yeah, that was it. Just same song twice. Okay. And that was it. It was out of my head. And the next day I was out and I came home and my mom said, uh, hey, Monty from the Ramones called you. And I said, did I leave something? Did I leave my strap behind or a cord or something? Like immediately I'm thinking of like, well, I must have left something there. They think and, I stole uh, something. <laughs> right, right. You know, but I mean, and that's the honest truth. That's really what first came to my mind first. I just, I didn't. I didn't think there was any way. So I picked up the phone. And I said, yeah, Monty, this is uh, Chris Ward. You, you left me a message. He said, um, yeah, okay. Uh, so you did good. Learn, uh, th learn three more songs and, uh, and come back on Monday. <laughs> I almost hit the floor. I was like, oh, okay. I was like, okay, great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the call. And, um, I learned three more songs, went back the next week and that started the process of auditioning for the, you know, of, of going through the audition process with them. And, uh, it was a couple of weeks that, that we were going back and forth, that I had gone back and forth. At one point I had to drive into Brooklyn to go to Marky's house to pick up a, um, a live tape, um, to learn the songs at live speed. I went down one day and all of a sudden they launched into live speed. I played for a couple of seconds and then I stopped and Johnny was like, what's the matter? You can't handle it. And I said, no, I can handle it. But if you want me to play at that speed, you have to give me a chance to learn it at that speed. And he was like, all right, go to Mark's house and go pick up a tape. Um, so I started to figure out that that it was I was getting I was along in the process here and, and they were still having me back. Mm. Of course, at this point, I'm I'm now a deserter from the Marine Corps. <laughs> I was going to say, what happened to your day job? <laughs> <laughs> so I. um uh, I called back to base and I said, um, I got on the phone with a corporal. I said, yeah, my name's Ward CJ private. I said, um, trying to just trying to find out what I need to do to get everything straightened out. So the corporal said, well, where are you at? We'll call you back. And I knew what that meant. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm home at my uh, mom and dad's and 15 minutes later, knock at the door, Suffolk County's finest, put me in cuffs, took me to jail. Bounty Hunter picked me up the next morning, took me to Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn. I washed vans there for about three hours before uh, two Marines picked me up, took me to the Naval Base in Philadelphia. I spent an evening there, and from there I got taken down to Quantico, Virginia, um, where I was taken into custody with a bunch of other other uh, unsavory characters. And... um. Uh, we, we, we were actually staying in, um, four man rooms. It was a, a barracks for, um, I think, it, I think they were, uh, security forces and, uh, I think they had deployed or they were in the field or something. So their building was empty. So they put us in four man rooms. And, uh, the first evening I was there, I was sitting in the common area with the rest of the guys and, uh, the, uh, corporal on duty came out and he was like, Hey ward, you got a phone call. And I was like, oh, it's my mother. She's going to be crying. I was like, ah, oh, this is not going to be pleasant. So I go over, I pick up the phone, and I hello, uh, Chris? Yeah, it's Johnny Ramone. I was like, oh. I go, <laughs> Just what you need. <laughs> I'm like, Johnny, I'm really sorry. I, I should have told you what I had going on. And he was like, well, what are they saying? I say, well, I was 
When I was down in Philadelphia, I was talking with a couple guys down there. A new commandant just took over uh, for the Marines, and they're cleaning house. Anybody who's uh, uh, UA or on desert of status, they're just writing everyone uh, discharges and, and clearing the books. He said, I said, I'll probably be here a month, a couple weeks to a month, and then I'm out. And he said, all right, well, do your time. Don't get in trouble. And when you get out, you got a job. And I almost fell over. I was like, I couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe that. First of all, I couldn't believe that Johnny Ramon would call me while I'm in custody. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, wow, that is just unreal, you know? So um, so here, here you are at your lowest point, and then – you get a phone call, just this this bolt of lightning that comes in that that is the best news you could potentially. Have. I'm really glad that you picked up on that because most people miss that point. They don't understand that this is the lowest point in my life. I've never been in in in, in just about in any kind of real trouble in my life. You know, I had a couple of run-ins with the police here and there, but I had never ever been in any kind of trouble like this where my 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 freedom was at stake. I don't know. It really was a, a real low point. And that, to go from like that to finding out that I'm going to be in the Ramones, it was uh, overwhelming to say the least. But the funny thing is, is there was just nobody to celebrate with. <laughs> it was like, I'm looking around for, and I can tell none of these guys even know who the Ramones are, you know? So, uh, so, yeah, so that's uh, how I found out I got the gig. And um, I was there for two weeks, uh, two weeks, maybe. Maybe it was a little more. Um, they woke me up uh, one morning, told me to pack my bag. Later on that afternoon, they uh, drove me over to the Greyhound station with a ticket to go back to Long Island and $30 and got on the Greyhound. 16 hours later, I got off the bus and uh, – Went home. I got home on a Friday afternoon. I called Monty up. I said, hey, Monty, I'm I'm back in New York. He said, all right, take the weekend to rest. And Monday we start rehearsing in earnest. We leave in five weeks for Europe. And then uh, learned 40 songs in five weeks. We rehearsed two or three times a week in those couple of weeks. And uh, September 30th, 1989, I played my first show in Leicester, England as a Ramon. <laughs> and how was that first show? How were you received? I got... I got brutalized at every show I did in every country we went to. I mean, I was covered in spit. I got hit with bottles and handfuls of coins and anything you could think of that kids could pick up off the floor or pull off their bodies. I got hit with, and it was, it was really trial by fire. But you know, I appreciated that a lot because it wasn't like I stepped out on stage and suddenly the the remote fans loved me. I earned my position in the band. I went through, you know, I ran the gauntlet and, and came out on the other side and, and, and the fans really accepted me. And that, that meant a hell of a lot more to me than if they would have been all, you know, lovey-dovey with me from the get-go. Because when I heard Dee, Dee left, and I can remember the day I heard he left riding in a car with a friend of mine, and I turned to my buddy and I said, I'll never go see another Ramones show and ain't the Ramones without Dee. Dee. <laughs> <laughs> instead i went to every single show the ramones played in until they retired but uh, but it's, uh it was it was quite the journey i really uh, i really i really did take i took a beating in the beginning were you treated well by the band were you, were you treated like a peer or was it a kid brother sort of relationship yeah it was more like it was definitely more like a kid brother thing um, and which i had no problem with at all but you know the I was friends with those guys without a doubt. They were my friends, you know what I mean? And and I'm not saying, I'm not trying to um, diminish what I meant to them or what they meant to me. They treated me, they treated me really well. But Johnny was like a mentor, mentor, you know what I mean? He was more like a father figure to me. Even though I was friends with him, I would, you know, I would... Nobody, nobody could talk to me like Johnny did. Any, most other people that that talked to me like he did a few times over a few things, I would have punched in their face. But it was Johnny Ramone, and 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 he was he wasn't just a friend. You know what I mean? He was still Johnny Ramone in my eyes, and he was my mentor and my teacher, and he was looking out for me. Mm. Me and Joey were way more like friends. Me and Joey went to shows together. We hung out together. I could say whatever I wanted around Joey. You know what I mean? It was it was a, a much different relationship. 
neither one was more important and I didn't love either one of those guys any more or any less. They really were that important to me. I suspect that was put you in a very difficult position because during that time, Joey and Johnny were not on the best of terms, I guess, to, yeah. to say the least. It was odd. Yeah. They're, they're legendary for their fights. What, what was the environment like for you? It was just, the. It, it was always tense. It was just always tense. You know what I mean? But it was like, Living in a house with parents who don't get along. That's exactly what it was like. They never really fought. They never argued. They didn't scream at each other and all that stuff. But it was just like a, a simmering intensity that was always kind of there. Mm. That That's really what it was like. So there was no um, argument or anything like that. You know, they they both understood how important what they were doing was. They knew how important they were to the fans. And they did what it took. To make it work. It's like parents staying together until the kids grow up and move away. They know that the kids are going to be better off in a stable environment. But with these guys, they understood the importance of the band, and they did what they had to do. Mm. Now, there was a, a rumor that uh, during the 90s, uh, Epitaph was looking at the Ramones to uh, oh. to bring to the label. Is, that, is, is there any truth to that story? So this is... This was one of the times, like I was telling you about, where I really disagree with Do Johnny. And this is the only time I ever questioned anything Johnny did business-wise. I never got involved with band business. They never made me involved with band business. I had nothing to do with decisions. Creative decisions, yes, but business decisions, no. Um, Brett Gerwitz was after the Ramones in the worst way. He really wanted them on the label. He flew into Amsterdam to see us and made a pitch to Johnny and Joey that I was excited about. I really, I knew who Epitaph was. I knew who Brett was. I knew what he could do for the Ramones. And, and what had kind of led to this situation was our contract was coming to an end. Our contract with our label was coming to an end. Um, and, uh, as was our contract with our booking agent. So it wasn't just Brett, it was leave home booking between the two of them. I knew that they would work to give the Ramones the, com the commercial success that they always wanted and never seemed to get. I knew that they would, I knew that Stormy and Brett Kerwitz would make it their life's mission to give that to the Ramones. Because they, the Ramones always secretly, not so secretly, but they always believed that they would be um, a commercial success. Mm -hmm. They started as a pop band. And they know? were always trying to write a pop tune and always releasing singles. So, they, yeah, they had that in their aspiration. Yep. And I knew that that was their best shot at having it at that advanced stage in their career. I knew we only had a couple of years left at this point. So after that, that meeting... Johnny had a discussion with the band at some point about what they had decided to do. And so he said, um, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to resign with our booking agency. And um, um, Gary Kerr, first our manager, is, get, is getting his own independent label. And it's going to be called Radioactive Records. And that's what we're going to do. And my head almost exploded. I was, I, I couldn't shut up. I couldn't keep my mouth shut. And I, I listed everything that he said. And I finally said to him, I said, John, I can't believe that you do not see the conflict of interest in signing with your manager's label and your booking agency. I was like, you gave both of them some of the greatest rock and roll ever recorded over the last 15 plus years and they could not bring it home for you. Why would you re-sign with them when you have the most hungry punk rock, strictly punk rock record label and booking agency who handled just about everybody big in punk rock these days? How would you pick them over, over these young people who have worshipped you since they were teenagers? How does that make, in what weird universe does that make any sense? And Johnny looked at me with his head cocked to one side like he always did. And he said, 
when you've got as many years in the business as I do, then you can tell me how to run the band. What I didn't know at the time, and of course what I became privy to later on, which made a lot more sense to me, was that Johnny and Joey had all kinds of little side cash deals made with Gary Kerr first, uh, you know, on, on making just cash on the side. They basically sold out the end of their career for, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars because they knew they were going to retire and they wanted to have X amount of money when they retired. And what Gary was promising them was going to get them to that number. They didn't have the fight left in them to, to start they, they again didn't. with Epitaph. They didn't. They didn't have the, they just, they had been so many times in their career, they had been told, this is the record that's going to break you. If you just work with this producer, it's all going to happen. If you just do this, you know, if you just do that, blah, 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 blah. And, and, uh, and they had just, they had heard it all and they felt like, um, they were going to go with the short thing. Mm. And unfortunately for them, you know, were it not for Lollapalooza, their career would have just petered out because we were on our final tour playing in the same little clubs that we had played that, that they had been playing since the seventies. We were playing at the same little clubs to the, you know, same little club crowds. And, um, uh, when the when the offer to do Lollapalooza came in, and that was the only good big thing about the end of their career was that they got to end it, you know, with with the biggest bands of 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 the '90s coming by their dressing room every day and and telling them, you know, how what a big influence they had been on all of them. Paying respect. Yeah, at least out of that, out of Lollapalooza, that's what they got. They finally understood how important they really were instead of how important they thought they should have been. So toward the end, when you guys were recording Adios Amigos, yeah. did you know Adios Amigos was the last album? I'm, I'm assuming from the title and the cover of the dinosaurs that that was a message, that this was the end, we're a bit old. Yeah. Did, did the band see themselves as dinosaurs at that point? Um, no, I... I I don't, I don't really think so. I don't think they really saw themselves that way. I think they kind of thought it was like funny, goofy humor that, that fit with, um, with the, you know, the humor they had always shown in their music and their, uh, and, and some of the, uh, artwork on some of the records. But, um, Joey had been diagnosed actually in 1994 with lymphoma and really struggled through the final two years of touring. I, and I don't mean, uh, you know, um, struggled like, oh, it was hard on him or struggled like, you know, um, he really had a difficult, difficult time. I mean, physically exhausted, barely able to, uh, to get himself through the day anymore. It took a lot out of him. Yeah. Yeah. He was, Joey was completely finished. Johnny, um, Johnny was, you know, felt himself slowing down and, and just felt like, you know, before it becomes glaringly obvious, I would like to, I would like to end it. Johnny wanted to go out, um, on a high note. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, we knew it was the last record. We knew, uh, we knew, you know, we knew it was all over with. Um, and, uh, the, the album cover is, um, done by a uh, famous New York City artist uh, named Mark Kostabi. And like everything else, there was some kind of weird slant on it that on how it got to be the album cover. You know, I, I think um, the, the original painting was promised to uh, Gary Kerfhurst, the oh. <laughs> manager. And I think that's why Gary lobbied for it and... Uh, and it became the album cover. You know, I I had pushed the Ramones to use a a Big Daddy Ed Roth type of um, artwork somewhere along the way, and um, it got shot down, of course, until somebody else came up with the idea, and we used it on the "We're Out of Here" cover for the final um, uh, for the final show documentary. 
and then again it got used on a uh, a Ramones tribute record put together by I think Rob Zombie had put that record together that featured everybody you know from Kiss to Tom Waits on it so it was uh, kind of fr- frustrating for me. I was like, uh, I hated the last album cover. I hate, and I hated that they they put dinosaurs on it because I didn't feel like that represented the the energy that the band still had left in it, and I didn't think it was clever or humorous in any way. But um, it ended up on there anyway. Yeah. So uh, toward the end, with Joey being sick, was it was Johnny sick at the same time, or did was it no? Okay. No, Johnny was not yet diagnosed. So Joey, had, when Joey passed, did that yeah. soften up Johnny at all? I mean, were they f- back to friends toward the very end? No, no. Um, a couple of people had made appeals to Johnny about it. But, you know, jo- what Johnny said really, I don't know, to me, it was really stayed in character with who Johnny was. And, and he said, it, it makes me look like a, like an idiot if I do that, that I was mean to him his whole life, you know, for the, for the last 20 plus years. And now that he's dying, I should go and be nice to him. He, he's, he just, he said, you know, that would be really, um, insincere, you know, he's like me and Joey never got along. We did not like each other. We didn't like each other. He's like, you know, uh, you know, am I, am I, am I sorry he's dying? Of course, you know, but the most telling thing that Johnny said, was something he said to me in a personal conversation right after Joey died. The first time we talked, he called me up and he said, well, that's it. We can never, uh, we can never play as the Ramones again. So Johnny understood there was no Ramones without Joey. And if you understand that the Ramones were the most important thing in Johnny's life, you understand what that really meant, what he was really saying, you know, Basically, what he's saying is there is no Ramones without Joey. Because he had said something once before in a conversation that I was there for, but he wasn't talking to me. Johnny had a lot of uh, friends um, that used to come out in certain parts of the country. And we were sitting around talking one day, and uh, and Johnny said, you know, I think if we would have had uh, CJ in the band from the beginning – a young, good-looking guy with a, you know, with a voice like CJ's, we would have cracked the commercial market. We would have bigger, been bigger than we are. And I was like, Johnny, how can you say that? I was like, Joey's got one of the, the best voices in the history of rock and roll. To me, Joey was always, you know, he was the heart of the band. You know, Dee Dee was, was the, the fire and the, and, the, and the energy of the band, you know, Johnny was definitely the driving force behind the band, but Joey was the heart of the band. Joey was absolutely the heart of the band. He was the most soulful, heartfelt part of the band. And 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 without Joey, I don't think <laughs> I think the Ramones might have had some great pop songs. They might have, you know, they might have done some great stuff, but I don't think they would have had the long-term career that they that they had, you know what I mean? That's like saying, you know, uh, Tom Waits would be a better artist if he would practice singing a little more. <laughs> you love Tom Waits because of of his voice, mm-hmm. because of the imperfections and the warts and the and the you know the the pimples on it. You know what I mean? That's what you love about it. Well, it's unique. It was like nothing else, and so yep. it really made the Ramones stand out. Uh, yep, so. absolutely. So to hear him say that after everything was said and done. When when Joey was gone, it made me realize that some you know some of the stuff he had rethought some of the stuff that he had said in the past and 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 come to a different conclusion, and that was um, very rare for Johnny, very rare. When he believed something, he usually believed it completely till the end. He didn't often change his mind. You stayed in touch with Johnny till the end. Yeah, I did. In fact, um, myself and and Johnny's personal friend and and my personal friend and now my my own manager gene frawley uh we were two of the last people that johnny asked to see before he passed and we were lucky enough to uh to be able to go and see him what's the memory of you two that you keep going back to even now with johnny yes 
there's a picture up on the internet. You can find it where it's a, it's a, a black and white photo of me and Johnny and we're both like hysterically laughing. I got my, my hand on Johnny's shoulder and we're both standing there laughing really hard. And it's a really simple thing that led up to, to what happened. But basically, um, we used to mess with Mark all the time. Mark, Mark was the guy in the band that made touring bearable. I mean, he could make you laugh at the most stressed out, aggravating minutes. Mark would say something that would just make you bust out laughing. He was really important to the band, you know, not just as a great drummer, but in that way. Um, so me and Johnny used to play pranks on Mark all the time. We, we, we played pranks on everybody, but on Mark and Monty especially. So that picture was taken. And if you look in the background of the picture, you can see Mark's leg sticking out from underneath the table. So what, what, what he, Mark used to be able to sleep anywhere. Um, so we were in a dressing room, and I think this was in South America. And Mark was sleeping under a table with just the lower half of his body sticking out. So... Me and John were trying to figure out what we what we were going to do. So I picked up, I think it was an apple, and I tossed it over, and it hit him right in the crotch. And as he jumped up, his head hit the bottom of the table, and then he went back down, and his head hit the floor, and he let out a yell. Me and Johnny laughed so were laughing so hard for, for a good five minutes after it happened. And whoever was in the room at the time that captured that picture captured a really – perfect moment um johnny was a serious guy loved to have fun and laugh but he was a really serious guy there aren't a whole lot of pictures even of him smiling never mind laughing but that picture was a really really uh a really good moment for, to have been caught <laughs> yeah yeah there's some there's something that's universally hilarious about somebody getting <laughs> hit in the crotch with something <laughs> yeah it, it was like a a, a, a skate off of benny hill or something like that but um but yeah, that, do you still talk to Marky? I don't. I ha I haven't talked to Mark in, in in a lot of years. Just after the band broke up, um, there was some 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 personal issues between me and Mark that just got blown up, and and uh, and that was it. We just uh, we haven't talked. I've tried to reach out to him a couple of times over the years. I don't, you know I don't have anything against Mark personally, and I've said that publicly before, and I've told him that. Um, but uh, there is just there's a an, an issue, an unresolved issue that I guess is just gonna. Uh, it's one of those festering things that just don't go away. But you know, I, I reached out to him to play, you know, to play together and um, and a couple of other things. But uh, you know, you can't have a happy ending with everybody, I guess. And uh, and I uh, I just accept it for that now. So let's quickly talk about uh, American Beauty. You're back with a new album. Uh, it's, yep. it's on fat rec. How did you connect with fat Mike? I was lucky to, um, Steve Soto and Dan root from the adolescents play in the band, uh, as well as Pete Sosa, who is, uh, the drummer from street dogs. When, uh, I, I put out my first record myself, uh, Ray Conquista, and it made a little bit of noise. Um, I had everybody on that record from Jay Bentley, uh, from bad religion. We had, um, uh, Billy Zoom from X. We had Dennis Casey from Flog and Molly. We had um, uh, who else is on that record? Gosh, it's such a long list of great players. Oh, Matt Katz played uh, from Debbie Harry played keyboards. Um, we had uh, Frank Agnew uh, play on it, who played with the Adolescents and Forty Five Grave. Um, we had John Johnny Mauer from um, Social Distortion play on it. We had just had this whole list of. of Southern California punk rockers play on the record. It made a good bit of uh, noise there in that community. And when we were recording the second record, uh, Steve Soto said, hey, I'm pretty good friends with Mike. You know, let me see if uh, maybe Fat would be interested. So um, Steve actually made the introduction and um, we did uh, punk rock bowling out in Vegas that year. Mm. Uh, the folks from Fat came by to see the show. They... They loved it. They, they really loved it, and they signed us up immediately. So we put my last record, uh, Last Chance to Dance, out um, on Fat, and we got out and hit the road hard. We tore our butts off at that one, and um, we 
sent, uh, you know, we, I let fat know that I'd love to do the next one with them. Um, they heard a couple of songs and, uh, they agreed. And here we are second record on fat. And mm. I got to tell you, I missed being on a label. <laughs> We've talked to several folks when they talk about uh, being on a label. Uh, Fat Rec has a fantastic reputation of making sure their artists are happy, well represented, paid. Um, <laughs> and so, once you get someone who's kind of that loyal to you in on the business end of things, you you don't want to leave for any reason. It allows you to be an artist. It allows you to be a musician instead of being having to be a full time businessman and a full time musician. You know, when you, when you got solid people behind you that are taking care of business and you don't have to worry about it and you can, I can call, I can call over to the label and get somebody on the phone for anything at any time. Uh, that's a, a huge safety net that is priceless. And this album, American Beauty, I've been listening to it for the past few days. It really is a well-constructed uh, single work in terms that it, uh, it's it got all the different elements musically. It's got a, a really strong songs in it, uh, really significant lyrics, I think uh, poignant in many cases, uh, especially uh, when you start talking about uh, Tommy's Gone, which I'm assuming is a, an homage to, uh, to Tommy Ramone. Uh, you've also got some humor in it. You've got the girlfriend in a graveyard. You've got uh, some some references to what I'm assuming is your youth with moral to the story. Uh, it yeah. really does feel like it's a personal record for you. Is it your most personal yet? I'm glad to hear you say that. It, this record was kind of um, unique in that all my other records, I had songs written sometimes years before I actually recorded them on my um, on my first record I did Post Ramones Bad Chopper and then Ray Conquista and 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 uh, Last Chance to Dance most of those songs I had written like I said almost years before with this record I had had a bunch of songs that I had been working on um, in between the recording of uh, Last Chance to Dance and this one and um, I do a lot of my uh, put a lot of my ideas down on voice notes on my phone and and um, and whatnot and uh and I had collected up roughly 16 songs, not com not all complete, not all lyrics complete, but I had about 16 songs that I had, I had worked on over two years. And when I finally sat down to start demoing, I didn't like any of them. They were, they just sounded, I don't know, uninspired or, or kind of contrived maybe or something. And I, but I was so close to a delivery date you know, we were getting close to the date I'm supposed to be delivering a record, and uh, and and I re had relaxed too much, figuring I had it, at least an album's worth of songs. When I realized how close I was, I almost got into a panic. So what I did was I I said, okay, on this date I'm going to start writing, and I um I stayed up about two weeks straight every night coffee and whiskey and sat in my basement and wrote that entire record in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, there's a whole lot of, you know, uh, you know, maybe the added stress, maybe this, maybe that, you know, there's a whole lot of maybes. It could have been this, could have been that. But um, I like to think that I've gotten to the point in my, in my, in my life, I guess, in my, you know, in my musical ability that um, I can just sit down and be honest when I write songs now and not have to try to think think up things that when I sit down and I'm, I get into the right state of mind and just let the, the, the creative process take over, that the songs just kind of come out. And it's, it's really, it was really a, a great experience. I really, while, while it was stressful and, 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 and hugely uncomfortable because it's not my usual style um what I, what what i got when i when i sat down and listened to the 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 mixed and mastered version for the first time i just got overwhelmed by a feeling like i i just had pretty much grown i pretty much had just watched myself grow as a musician or an artist or however you want to say it but um that I, I kind of have turned had turned a corner. There were there was a, a, a couple little spots where I I had trouble with inspiration. Um, that's where girlfriend in a graveyard came from. 
Um, like I mentioned earlier in the interview, I was a huge uh, Hammer fan. I loved the Hammer films when I was younger and, and vampire and monster films in general. And uh, so what I did was I just went online and I pulled up a Hammer film and, and Caroline Mon Monroe, who is a beautiful actress who played uh, one of the brides of vampire of uh, Dracula. And uh, I, I, I put on the movie uh, Dracula AD 1972 and she was in that and, she was the inspiration for that instant inspiration for that song. And, um, being able to write something as serious as, as, uh, as a uh, moral to the story, which is about, you know, the, the whole concept of, um, trying to keep your, your friends memories alive by talking about them and, and telling stories about them, um, to go from that to girlfriend in the graveyard on the same record, uh, for me was, uh, Felt good. <laughs> Felt good to do it. Well, it colors in your your personality a bit because it's it feels to me like you're really finding your artistic voice here. For many years, you were part of a unit. Uh, you've now been on your own for the last decade or so, uh, and you're really taking control of the helm. You're you're finding your uh, um, uh, what makes it personal. What really makes it CJ. So that's that's what I took away from this listening experience. That's good insight. That's good. I I, I like that. That's <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, but um, that's that's good. I like that. Nothing like a deadline to make it get stuff done either. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. You're not kidding. I, I I'm, and I'm I have been so used to not have to having to worry about uh, deadlines for such a long period of time and doing things pretty much at my own convenience and my own speed. It was a real concern. I didn't know if I would be able to to do it. But I, I have to say, it really it turned out to be a, a really great experience. So I'm really happy to do. It. I don't know that I would want to repeat it in that way. I don't want to turn it into a formula. I I much prefer to write songs uh, when I feel inspired or when I feel something coming on. But um, I gotta say that was neat. That was a pretty neat <laughs> experience, and only because the the result was uh, because I'm so pleased with the results. If the results would not have been good, it would have been uh, – We'd be having much, a different conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think we probably wouldn't be having a conversation. I, I would probably be buried somewhere. Yeah. But um, You'd still be on that cruise. Yeah. Um, I appreciate I appreciate your, your comments on it, though. That's great. So, CJ, thank you so much for spending time with us. Again, the album is American Beauty. Uh, it's available at Fat Rec. Dot com. Go order. There's the, the LP edition uh, that comes with a digital download for 12 bucks. It's a typical fat rec pricing, which is always great and easy and simple for everyone. And it's a great album. Make sure to check it out. CJ Ramon. Also check out uh, CJ on tour dates. I think you're touring for the better part of 2017. You can find those tour dates over at CJ Ramon. And, of course, check him out on Facebook. Facebook.com slash CJ Ramon. I think that's the yeah, that's great. perfect CJ. Thank you so much for spending time with us and Godspeed to you, man. Thanks a lot.